I mean, it, it is a lot. I mean, we just generated, we, our, work, our charge was to be generative, and so we were, and so uh, that was fantastic. Um, and so now it is the sorting part. So how do we make sense of this big list that we just got? And I do think, I mean, there's, we all might have our favorite way of, of parsing the issues. You could parse them by what kind, you know, we, I, even how we organized the meeting was in terms of the, the flow, the, the usual flow of a research project. So you could, you could do, um, I, I'm not, I'm connected over here. Um, <laughs> you could do issues by, you know, starting, uh, starting a project, you know, who defines the, the research question, how, what projects are getting funded, how those funding decisions get made. Um, you could have a whole list of questions doing a project, you know, where you're actually doing, what are the data collection methods, data, you know, who's gathering the data, you know, how are we making sense of the data we get. Um, and then you can do um, kind of the, the disseminating a project or, you know, closing a project. Um, I'll just do closing, it's broader. So closing a project which has all of those returning results, getting findings out, getting findings out to whom, how do we make sense of what we have, um, where's the stewardship and sustainability that happens. So I think we can, we won't, we won't do that that would be too tedious for us all to do this together <laughs> to try to sort by that um, for right now. But one, a, a different way, and, and then I think other themes that are ways I'm thinking about too is that we've got a whole set of kind of tools and methods. So this idea of um, people have talked about studying what works, you know, that there's good projects that are going on right now. So how did the trust building happen? How did we get to a community-driven project? What, how, what kind of capacities were needed on, on all sides for everyone to help make that project happen? So those kind of studying what's working can help us get to some tools and methods that can become what we're calling good practices, you know, and then we can evaluate them further and get to best practices. So, I mean, that's, that's one strategy. I think we shouldn't, even while we're, I think why I was pushing a little bit on the definitional issues, is that while I realize we have a lot of conceptual clarity to get to and some of these taxonomies to work on, um, we have a lot that is already currently ongoing. And so I want to know what can we learn from what's already working so that we can have some of those tools and methods of people who are already, who want to engage in this work and, and can, um, who can engage more quickly. And just one very concrete example, I think the, the evaluation metrics uh, manual that NIEHS has developed that was mentioned earlier, it's a concrete, you know, eight chapter manual with some very specific tools that help give me as an academic researcher, it's like when I do partnership development as part of my grant activity, I actually, it's not just hand waving, I actually have language process tools to be able to describe and characterize and assess how I'm doing and make visible the work that I just invested that year to the funders and, and to other people. So that, that's just an example of a tool. Um, yeah. Another tool that came to mind as you were saying that is the CTSA Community Engagement Group put a handbook together that's actually quite good too. Good. CTSA Community Engagement, I didn't see where that voice came from. Deb, okay, good. Um, yeah, that's been a very active group with some good publications. So we talked about there's some normative work here too. What's, what are our responsibilities? And what, um, and then I think there's, there's the sort of uh, social science work of how do, you know, justice, how do we enact justice and power um, and and recognize the, the values that are working across all of us here. So there's, I think these are just at least some domains of work. So are there other sort of big domains of sort of research, either research areas or approaches that we can talk about of what you're seeing in our findings? Communication, I would list as one of those big okay. issues. Because um, that's kind of a cross-cutting issue, no, right? It's, it's got to be its own or it doesn't happen well. Okay. Kelly? Yeah. 
We talked about the regulatory, the legal. Issues. Oh yeah. Um. And and could I, um, this is Steve. Uh, yeah. Make an observation about what you've written on the slide yeah. on the line with justice, power, and values. Yeah. That um, I don't think we can necessarily uh, get that from any particular disciplines. Yeah. Whether they're physical, Thank biological, you. or social sciences. Sure. And and a lot of them are going to come from outside of science entirely, like from grassroots movements. Uh, and so on, and maybe from the legal sphere. So they, I, I would just suggest, yeah. Uh, Thank I think you. you I, I think um, structural. Um, I was trying. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to do the lumping um, instead of the splitting. So I was trying to find a, what's the what's a tag that I could use for that category. But I I hear you. It's gonna. I think because these are sort of the structural and cultural issues that we're going to have to address if this is going to if this work is going to fly in a meaningful way, and some of that has to do with power. Some of it has to do with the regulations and the policies. Kelly, um, I would also say, at least at the university, many and growing civic studies is where lots of that stuff exists. Great, and it's growing aggressively in an, at a number of places. Thank you. And I want to put in another plug for this kind of civic science group that Eric and I participated in, where our colleagues in community organizing and civic engagement have so many strategies and tools. I think this is my, my thin placeholder of tools and methods on this slide, is saying that we have so much we can, but we don't have to invent it. It's out there and so well established and well functioning. We just, it might be in different areas than, at least as an LC researcher, it's in a different bucket than I'm used to looking. So I have to expand my, my, the places where I'm looking for my tools and methods. Sorry, I just have to address that comment. Yeah. Because I, you know, being a non lc person, I don't understand that. I don't understand why research and scientists continue to wear different hats and act, act schizophrenic all the time. I, I don't understand it. And I deal with it all the time. Sorry, but this is one of my frustrations, obviously. Um, I'm dealing with the same people in the same meetings in, that have different topics, and they act like they don't know anything about that other topic. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it is. It's we should, why, I mean, LC work is important, but I think one of the messages some of us were trying to get across is LC has to integrate into all of research. And, you know, that's, so we can't think about just ELSI issues here. They're, they're research issues. There's an ELSI component that you have to contribute to these research issues. And, and I, I would add, uh, I'll, I'll tell on Dave that I, um, <laughs> or at least this is what I t already told Dave, as I think the Venn diagram that was given to us at the beginning of today uh, is drawn incorrectly, and it, it fits with what Deborah just said, yes, is that it suggests that there's part of NIEHS and NIH research that doesn't involve ELSI, and it suggests there's part of citizen science that doesn't involve ELSI, which is wrong. So Elsie, and I think this is what Deborah's saying in another way, is that Elsie's circle needs to be bigger than the other two, and Elsie involves things that are not citizen science and that are not NIH, but everything that's involved in citizen science and NIH research is within Elsie, and that brings it to be integrated rather than siloed and considered separately. What's the definition of your definition of ELSI? Because that seems much broader. Than so I think I'm going to just put, I'm going to capture these as what we'll call provocative statements that have come out oh, of this yeah, meeting. Because I think, I, I really, I, after. I, I, I don't understand that. No, after like, I think it's the, this idea, 
I am, I'm yeah, like yeah. A, a thousand percent behind. Ba Let's basically, get... it's just a simple answer is that all questions about what hypotheses to address or what to describe in nature or whether or not to take action on mm. what or how to uh, avoid exploiting participants in research. Mm -hmm. All th that, those are LC issues that affect all science. Mm -hmm. And we could, and we could sit here. We, uh, you know, we could have a productive session saying, "Let's list all of the assumptions." No, no, no. Like, uh, and one thing we were talking about is, and I, uh, you know, federally funded research is federally funded. Therefore, it's congressional mandate. Therefore, it's kind of publicly accountable. Therefore, there's some sort of social contract. Therefore, what does it mean to be have federally funded research be of benefit to the public. I mean, I think we could bring it all the way back to some of these basics. And I, that we might just tag, you know, we tagged it in our group as just one of the domains that is worth making really clear, saying what, saying what is the, so, are we making good on the social contract currently for federally funded research? And if not, how, are there some, is citizen science perhaps a method that helps us get closer to making good on that, that, that social contract? I know Carol had a comment, and then I'll go to Eric. Can you, point, you, you, you got to still get it to a microphone, other than the, the web people get upset. Um, so if you can go off one slide. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh. Anyway, um, right, under issues, um, we, we talked a lot in my group about the um, hypothesis generating role for um, communities. <laughs> citizen scientists, so I, I would add under issues before starting a project, um, conceiving of a project or, or um, yeah, I guess developing, right, because it really, it's not just the start of the project, it's the, it, it's the concept of what we should be studying, and that's a huge area, I think. I put that, I'm a lumper, so I put that in that bucket, but I'll, I'll make it visible for you. Okay. Eric? Uh, I'd like to amend the comment I just made before about civic studies as a place. It's knee-jerk university <laughs> siloing. In fact, what's happening at, at least at our university, is that civics is outside of the colleges and departments. And it's student-driven. And so in much the same way that the LC issues are larger than all those other, other things, civics at the university is growing as an issue outside of just the classroom, outside of research, outside of dorm life. It's grow. It's it's larger than those, and I think as a result, it it there's an equivalency between those 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 things. So this sense of agency among students and agency and community building that's done in an ethical, legally uh, thoughtful and socially thoughtful ways. So, I partly that makes me think too, Eric. An overarching question here is just who that keeps coming up is who who's leading, you know, not just who's at the table, but but who's leading and who, um, where are we going to listen? Well, I think at least at UMBC, it is facilitated by folks who are on the payroll, but it's led by students. It, it is the the purpose is to accelerate student engagement. The purpose isn't to lead students in direction. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to give students the tools from which they can develop their own initiative. Oh. Which that reminds me that was another one of my big buckets was capacity building capacity was another theme that came up and we were talking about bidirectional capacity building. So the capacities that need to be cultivated are all all throughout this research ecosystem, not in one one way or the other. Can and I yeah, comment on that. Sure. <laughs> okay, this table's weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep hitting my knee on the table. <laughs> so just yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and, and and just to to think about the assumptions. Getting back to the point of assumptions that we. So I I've started. So I've started to use the term instead of using empowerment with an e. I'm starting to use em empowerment with an I. And the reason why I'm doing it is we're assuming that people do not have power. Mm. They may not be actualizing that power. They may not have access to that power. 
but it, it's a recognition that from my CCPH colleagues, people always talk about coming and empower the community. We have power. Helping us build capacity so we can use the power, mm -hmm. that's different. And so I think that's part of bi-directionality is, is understanding what our assumptions are, and I think we will see on, that's part of the discussion, but so that's capacity building so communities can ask, better access that power, the opportunity structures needed to access power, right? And then on the academic side, being an academic who's a one foot in, one foot out person, how can we uh, build capacity to change institutional cultures that will allow this kind of work to be more valid, I mean not valid, more valued within the system? So others like me, because I'm going to do the work regardless. It's who I am. It's my spirit. So if it's not valued or not, I'm going to keep doing the work. I'm going to keep having the impact. But there's other young folks, faculty members, who are not doing the work because they don't see that it's been valued in the tenure and promotion process. There's not enough grants to fund it. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going into this work and they're leaving academia because of that. Yeah. So I think that capacity building needs to happen as well. Elizabeth. So, so when I look at bi-directional, and I, and I do think that our capacity has to be built, we also think that we have to help you build your capacity. Yep. Um, and, and I think it has to be we who help you build that capacity as opposed to uh, a consultant or someone that you bring in uh, to help you get to that point where you can integrate uh, a lot of those things that are on that page, like the, the relationship and the structural and the cultural shift, right? Uh, so, and, and oftentimes we get bought in without resources, right, to talk about our communities, uh, but there's funding to pay for consultants who don't have any experience actually operationalizing mm. these things to do that. So I think that bi-directional is, that also is a power thing, a power relationship, mm -hmm. where uh, basically we know that we have to build in a relationship where we support each other in these meaningful ways. Thank you. Mildred and then Jason. Um, I had something, I think it's on the next slide that, that you had. Um, and it has to do with the second bullet. Um, I would feel better if that statement were actually a question. Mm. I, I'm not, I think that's an assumption that needs to be tested. Yeah, it was a bold statement that was made earlier in the, the meeting, so I was putting it on our list of provocative statements to consider, but I think we can, does all, <laughs> does, this kind of is our taxonomy, it's a version of our taxonomy question. Are there, are there kinds of research that fall outside of citizen science or that just wouldn't be amenable to it? And, and why, if so, why? But um, that's fine. Good. Um, we had Jason and then Jeff. Oh, micro microphone, Jason, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I think just in terms of, for me, my overarching goal is to make participation in research a cultural activity. And I, I, I just keep feeling these tensions in all these different ways that, and this is just more of a comment, I don't know where to go with it. Um, but it's really access to power, building capacity, uh, and it's not necessarily, I, I feel really, I, I feel like that in many ways has to happen outside of the institutions uh, where people live and work. If we want to make science part of culture, then uh, there should be a really strong focus on capacity building of not necessarily existing institutions to accommodate citizen science. I think that's important, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, uh, I'm struggling with the access to power, uh, and making sort of citizen science something that everybody can participate in. And I'm just imagining if you want to si sign up for citizen science, then you have to go to your local university uh, or academic center to do that, and uh, that's not what I'm hoping for. <laughs> um, can I maybe build on, on that as an example is when we talk about crowdsourcing, for example. How many individuals who are a part of the crowdsourcing actually 
know what that's about from the scientific point of view. That that what what sci how science is looking at their participation in that. Do they actually feel like they are actively participating in research? I think in some cases yes, and in some cases no. So that may be like one of the underlying themes is when we are doing these activities and engaging people into the process, are we also letting them know that they're actually being engaged into a research process and what that means? Okay. Who did I miss over here? Oh, Jeff. <clears throat> so I, I want to um, look at the next slide, your uh, methods slide, I guess. <clears throat> to, to the point, though, about um, taxonomy, and this has been kind of bothering me throughout, and I've said this at our table, it feels to me like we, we're talking about citizen science as if it's one thing, and everybody in the room knows it's not, and the taxonomy is going to be very complicated. We, we can't, I think, understand even how to do that without something like ethnographic research, sort of getting into the science and seeing how it's done, and the issues will then be clear or surface as a part of that research. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of more like the process through which uh, Genome Canada funds some of their gels, so-called gels research. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether that lives on your list there, uh, normative tools, methods, whether it's eth ethnography effectively or something like that. But I, I don't think we can do a lot of the work that we're talking about without having a better sense of what the it is. Yeah, and I think uh, um, I might have apples and oranges on this list, but I um, because I think if we picture, let's just picture a product that where this is heading. So I, I'm not. This is not happening. This is an imaginary. This is a, this is a, a thought experiment. Let's just say um, that NIH issued an RFA that said, "We here's an RFA for um, LC issues in citizen science, and we're especially in, interested in exploring." in proposals that will be responsive to these six uh, kinds of domains and questions. I think the work that we're doing here today is trying to sort of kind of define what would those four to six priority areas that the NIH would decide to put on an RFA would say, we really want some work done in this area. And then it's up to you all as a, all of you as a research community to say, the best methods I have available to me to be able to, an to explore a question like that could be X, Y, Z, could be ethnography, could be surveys, could be um, a community-driven effort to do something else. So I wasn't trying to say what are the, what are the LC research tools we have available to us to solve some of these problems. I was trying to say no, fair enough. what are the kind of domains right. of investigation that we think will advance the field and practice right now. So maybe I'm using words that are not the ones I intend, but there needs to be a, on that list, I think, this kind of sense of understanding what the practice of citizen science is, okay. whether that's called oh, okay. ethnographic work or something else. Got I, didn't it. Mean, I didn't mean to imply that Got it's it. a tool we ought to list. I, I think that actually kind of helps solve some of the problems I'm having. It's because for me, like I know I work in a variety of communities of practice already um, that are some of them have academic affiliation, some of them live outside of academic world, and sort of uh, having sort of community. For me, I, I would hope that uh, there would be a partnership with existing communities of practice out there, and sort of having that recognized of like who's already doing work in this, and how do we work with them. Great. Does descriptive, if I put descriptive work on this list, does that help you all to say like what, and I, I did, I lumped it too far under my tools and methods, because I, when I meant that to say, we have work that's already going on, we need to understand how it's working so that we can share out those good practices and, and grow from there. It, but it's sort of a deep description. Uh, to me, when you, only because it's, it's a bit of short shrift to call it descriptive work. Uh, so as long as we understand what we're talking about, shorthand is fine. Okay. Um, Rich, uh, Rich, and then Karen. As we begin to think a little bit about um, RFAs and those sorts of things, one thing I would put on the table is that 
in the spirit of citizen science, I think it would be a mistake for NIH to issue an RFA independent of some of the big players in the citizen science space. And that's something that would be a collaborative uh, release or call for applications that would involve some of the major citizen science players would be much more effective, in my opinion. Okay. So there are a number of founda private foundations, for example, that we've alluded to in this context. And thinking about NIH trying to set a research agenda for LC studies of citizen science as a unilateral activity, I think, is, uh, again, very um, antithetical to what we're talking about in the spirit of the meeting. I would much rather see some consortium of funders in this space as opposed to it being simply an NIH-led initiative. Right. So I, I think what I hear from that is um, you would like us to not do this in a vacuum, work with the other um, organizations out there that have supported research in this area, that have already begun programs in this area, and think about leveraging that, yeah? Okay. And can I also add that there, uh, I would not delay uh, investment and capacity building of citizen science in the United States with doing this study first, but it would be really interesting to simultaneously and parallel for the NIH to look internationally at where, uh, what other countries, governments are support, how they support citizen science. For example, you could look to Austria, uh, who has uh, some federally, uh, sort of federal support built into their scientific funding that goes into uh, community engagement that's very citizen science focused. It's, um, and there, you know, so it, it might actually be worthwhile to sort of compare on, on big national levels how people are doing this around the world. And Elaine. I, I think the issue, too, is um, it gets back to what do we mean by citizen science? And is this citizens being involved in research? And we're talking about biomedical research here where there's not a long history of in these kinds of organizations. And so the question is we certainly need to leverage that, but there, are there new models or new things that we need to do in whatever our community defines as citizen science. Thank you. And can I uh, take um, prerogative to ask one question that was raised at the very, very beginning that I haven't heard really explored? There was this assumption, somebody said stars uh, aren't worried about their privacy, so you can release stars, you know, information about stars and birds publicly and broadly. But biomed what is unique, what is unique about doing citizen science in the biomedical space? And so privacy was mentioned. What else other than privacy makes biomedical research perhaps unique or different than ornithology um, and, and some of the, the, the fact astrological that, work? That birds and stars or galaxies are not trying to improve their conditions, their own conditions. So they're not like patients who need quality care. They're not like communities who need to be freed from the burdens of pollution or denial of basic amenities. And, and that is a fundamental difference uh, with a model of uh, non-scientists, in quotes, serving to collect data for scientists as workers. Okay. What else? What else? Karen? Sure. Also on that, I think also you need to put this in historical context. I mean, we have a tradition in biomedical research in F and in ethics that we have this concern for protection of humans that may be different than the history of involving citizens in counting birds and stars. I mean, it's just a different kind of tradition. So it goes back to the earlier point about <laughs> The descriptive so, work. Sure. Again, I mean, about it all goes back to your definition because I think we could do some great descriptive work or whatever we call it mm -hmm. um, in defining models of citizen science that have worked, or maybe how do we define work, and ones that haven't. I mean, learning more about what the state of the art is would really be very important. Sure. Uh, and, 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 but it would, it's worth distinguishing that in yeah. the sense that. We, in addition to a human subjects review right. view board, we have a vertebrate animals review right. board. Yeah. So we see, we do have a long tradition 
of scientists being responsible, having ethical responsibilities for non-human animals. Right. But those non-human animals are not organizing to change the world. That's but, the key, but I would argue. But they have proxies. Well, and I, I do think right. it's a chance. I, I think it will, it's an important flag to say this is the current regular. This is, we have a, a history here that has built up and as our current regulatory environment and as our current research ethics built around protection of people. I think remember a lot of there's a lot of people who would want to th kind of that revising that language and that assumption that people need to be protected, you know, but but not losing those vul real vulnerabilities and harms. And it goes back to the paternalism word exactly. which was used yesterday. I think exactly. That's um, CCPH actually, says, which has been men mentioned multiple times, is working on, um, we're working on kind of a revision to the Belmont report from a community-based, uh, community-driven research perspective. And so that's, you have that to look forward to in the next couple months. Elizabeth had her hand up, and then in the back you haven't had a chance to comment. I'm not sure the, the birds aren't organizing. Uh, they may be flying to safer spaces, but but what what I will say is is unique about this time that we're living in is that the demographic is getting older, uh, so we have a huge population that's older. Um, we've got also an increase in a population that has a history of um, of public health disparities that's growing too, and so we sort of have to pay attention to uh, the fact that the population in itself that is most at risk is growing. And that that, um, that contributes to us looking at um, how we serve the public differently, I think. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, suggest for your list the two obvious points. People have rights. People have lawyers. <laughs> OK. Duly noted. Thank you. Eric? I would maybe like to offer, maybe I'll come up to the board. Um, in the spirit of the, the civic science um, workshop we were at, um, one of the participants offered a sort of a grid for trying to figure out maybe what the taxonomy should look like. And I'm kind of working on one, and, and I'd like to draw it on the board just for folks to see if this, if, if maybe we can fit some of the various activities that are science onto the grid is maybe a way for us of conceiving how diverse the world of, of uh, uh, citizen science is. Sure, and um, I think, well, if, if you if you'd like to come up and draw while yes. we keep talking, that's exactly that would yes. sure please. Um, and I know, I mean, even um, you know Andrea's work, the survey that she was cited on the first day. I think her survey of of citizen science practices probably got to a lot of this mapping, some of this mapping. So I think we could say, again, if there was a working group on building a taxonomy of citizen science, we'd have a lot of data and tools and studies and thinking and grids to, to draw on. So I think um, this will this will just be a little example, a little taster of what, what you might get. Um, I'm going to, we want to take a few more questions. And then I do, I want to also, I'm going to, I get to hand this all over to Jeff, <laughs> which I'm very excited to do. Um, but I, um, you know, and so Le Leah. And so I think there's a tendency to look at citizen science as a way for better data collection. But there are some projects that are emerging where uh, community members, individuals are actually contributing to the problem solving. To, to addressing very difficult or complex scientific problems, and I think Fold It is one example of that, where a few members of uh, the gaming community were able to manipulate uh, proteins in a way that the computationally they had not been able to achieve, and we're seeing that in other fields as well. So I think looking forward, that's a unique place where uh, citizen scientists, volunteers are coming with fresh eyes. Uh, they don't come with, as Jennifer Couch and earlier we were talking about, and we were talking about Steve Wing, they don't come with their blinders on of preconceptions of what the, what's hot in the scientific community. They're able to discover new things like Zooniverse, discovering a whole new form of galaxy, whereas the astronomers just said, oh, that's an anomaly. 
Um, yeah, and I thank you, Leah. I think um, I think the comments been noted that we wanted this isn't just passive data collection, not just sending your data in. That what what citizen science the citizen science we're talking about is a a more completely integrated um, participatory process. Gabe. All right. I think can everyone hear me? Okay. I use this right. Um, one thing that I was thinking about with the key questions that make and provocative ideas around. Um, how biomedical science is different is just the diversity of the data itself. When you start collecting all these different types of data, I think that makes it more difficult to know what LC methods you need to use, um, which communities are going to be using those methods, how people are going to react to privacy, all of these issues. It's just something that came to my mind. So. Thank you. And I think I've also heard some people mention it's more why we get so excited about the returning results issue is because of the sort of implication. There's sort of real, there's real life implications of the results um, that we're re, uh, releasing. So if you release uh, your preliminary study of your bird count, you're not um, yet creating any lasting, sort of potentially lasting effects of that. Um, uh, so. I'm going to take, yes, way in the back there. Nancy. Um, one other area that might have thought about some of these things, too, is that it also seems one thing that's happening in citizen science is it's bringing different ways of knowing or maybe cross-disciplinary. There is some work that's been done on team science some of the ethics of team science and then also, you know, like validation that one field right. knows something in one way versus, and it devalues how another field knows or doesn't knows, but then also then all of a sudden you're creating new disciplines and yep. so there might be some things that can be learned from, I know a lot of people are thinking about team science and some of the ethics and some of the roles and responsibilities and how you work together, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a uh, that's another. It's an example of a very rich existing body of work that we can learn from, for sure. Um, I, I want to start to bring us to a close. Uh, Andrea, oh yes, please. If you could return to the unique slide for a moment, yes. Um, yeah. So our table has been murmuring, and Karen Cooper is also passionately tweeting the right. point that not all of these issues are necessarily unique to biomedical research, particularly privacy. Location-based privacy is a really significant cross-cutting issue. Also, the idea that people are at stake with real health impacts and disparities is a big issue in some of the environmental monitoring initiatives. Uh. But I think that what's really unique about this is that these are at the forefront of the cultural awareness of biomedical researchers. And I don't know if that means that NIH might be best equipped to lead charges in these directions or what that might mean, but just a little perspective from parallel communities. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I think partly because I sit part-time in the environmental health world, I, for me, the environmental um, research sciences are always sort of part, but I hear you, there's a whole another there's independent environmental research that isn't biomedical. Um, that has health impacts, but so this isn't this is a candidate list. It's not it's not a definitive list. And um, the other piece, I mean, why we're even bothering to do this at all is because if I mean I think there was a claim because there are existing successful models of citizen science in some of our other our other sister organizations and disciplines. So why couldn't biomedical research just adopt wholesale some of those models over you know? And I think this claim that, well, biomedical research is different in, a, in, in important ways that would mean we couldn't wholesale adopt some of these existing models. And I think that's, this is, that's an open question. I'm stating that as a, I would like to state that as a question, but that's how it's been framed, at least in the, organ, in the, in the evolution of this meeting. Sema and then uh, I think Jeff. that that this kind of coordination of sharing of practices that the federal um, community may play a role in that, Lee, in this coordination of what works from one field to another, that that might be a role that this federal community practice might, yeah, that might be part of their role. Exactly. Jeff and David. On, on this list, um, there's also this the sense that biomedical research 
uh, sorry, biomedical information is treated in very particular <coughs> ways in, in regulation. We have really specific rules and laws about what you can and can't do with the kind of information that's generated by biomedical slash environmental research. I'm thinking of not just the human subject stuff, but HIPAA and all of the things that we um, don't need to list, but that that's, that's part of what's going on here. That's part of the, um, the bullet list, frankly, of the things that are relevant for how we ought to be thinking about citizen science. Um, would this be fair that this is a regulated environment, so there are, are things, you know, like... But lots of things are regulated environments. It's a very particular kind of regulated environment, I guess is what I would say. Sure. And, and like it or not, this, what we're talking about the last two days is, is coming into this highly regulated area, right? Yes. And so it, maybe it's not what we it would do from scratch, but it's the reality that we are inheriting. And I, and I think this, this pushes, this perhaps is another area, and it's been certainly an area for discussion um, in this meeting, but it is, I mean, our existing regulatory structure came from somewhere, it didn't fall out of the sky. And so is it now that, you know, as technologies evolved, social um, expectations have evolved, cultures has, have evolved, do our existing regulatory structures still serve us? in the ways that they were intended back when we built them. And I think, um, Larry, uh, is John Wilbank still here? It, you, you quote um, is it Larry, um, Larry Lessig quite often about kind of where is the locus of change. And if we're waiting for the regulations to change before we change, that's not going to happen. And, and that's not how it happens either. I mean, that technology changes first. So it will social and cultural communities change of uh, practice change first. Technologies change and drive that, and then our practices and our policies catch up with it, and then eventually the regs catch up with all of that. So I think some of us, we often talk about the regs being kind of giving us the floor of our behavior, but it's really up to us as communities of, of citizens and scientists and, and researchers to say, what is our, what's our standard of excellence? How do we want to, what kind of work do I want to do in this world, and what's important to me? And so um, I think we have to be conscious of the regulatory frames that are there without having those feel like they define us completely. And I, I, I've actually participated. Oh, sorry, am I jumping in on somebody? Um, <laughs> no, go Soko ahead, go Sokovi, ahead. go ahead. And go ahead, go ahead. You're starting. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, on that regulatory uh, framework, I've, I participated in the biotechnology framework at an analysis of, you know, 35 years after the first sort of attempt to regulate after Asilomar and genetic engineering technologies, how does the policy framework serve our new environment today? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the time scale that a lot of policy works on is 30 years, you know, 40 years of going back and revisiting, how is it doing? So I just want to say that, uh, you know, laws are here to serve us, uh, and it is really worthwhile LC research to do those workshops and to say, what are the policy frameworks and do they serve us? And a lot of this already goes on, but for those who haven't ever participated in an evaluation of how, of what current law and recommendations on whether that should be updated, it's really important and interesting work. And Which is the group that's leading that, Jason? Uh, well, this was the JCBI. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so uh, Rich and I were on the uh, IOM, NAS, um, Exposure Science in the 21st Century Report. So we have a chapter in, in there on ethics. But the reason I mentioned that report, we talked a lot about these new tools. I know we talked, we had a sort of brief points about new tools, but we go into great detail about the type of exposure tools, uh, ubiquitous monitoring, ubiquitous sensors, Mm -hmm. I mean, so what does that mean when we want to have this data as it relates to collecting all this pollution data, real time spatial data, which we know all our cell phones we're being tracked, you know, right now, and we 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 we're fine with that. But that's that's there's some tension with HIPAA because we have a lot of data, our own personal data is out there right now, right? Social marketing data. When I go online to Google, I always get my comic books and Marvel stuff comes up because I'm a comic book collector. You know, so I'm, they track where I go. And so that's happening all the time right now. 
So what does that mean when, when we're trying to do this kind of new kind of work? It's not new, but with, the, with, with HIPAA, with RRBs, we don't have community RRBs because a lot of this citizen science work, and at least the work I do, is more about the community. But the RRBs as they stand now, that's not really representative of, of the community needs and really being able to address those, the benefits for communities. It's the benefits for the individual, but it's not the benefits for communities. So I think that that's, that's a major question that I think we need to figure out a way to raise as well. Uh, with the data that's there all the time and the data that's very protected, like very regulated, but if you're a citizen scientist trying to address health disparities, how is that going to work? Yeah. Right? Yeah. How is that really going to work? Yeah. Thank you. I think um, I'm going to take Leah as my last comment and then um, turn things over to Jeff. And I think, uh, well, go ahead, Leah, and then I'll kind of wrap us up here. Oh, I just quickly on Jason's point, uh, how does the current regulatory and legal environment serve us? How does the citizen science and projects that we're doing inform the legal and policy environment? Don't necessarily mean advocacy. We're science. How do we inform? How does how does it inform the policies? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, really, I think between so between this morning, um, the the real generation of ideas this morning, and then just now this sort of deepening and extending. I think, you know, again coming back to our organizers' charge for us, I get that some of you might be like, well, the thinking that LC is too narrow of a frame. Um, or NIH funded research is too narrow of a frame, but frankly that was the charge of this meeting. Um, and we thought to get around this universe, which is so large, this kind of gave us one starting point. Um, and so I think it is, our charge has been to map, and I think you all have done a remarkable um, piece of work, to map what are some of the, the research areas and domains that are really going to be critical for us if we're going to be able to work effectively, um, if the NIH-funded research enterprise is going to be able to work effectively in the citizen science space. Suma. Kelly, I wanted to ask, because like a lot of people here, a lot of us are getting tired. And yeah. I know I'll think of other things after the meeting. Could you share these slides that we could add to them after the meeting oh. or cogitate on them some more without waiting for a meeting summary to come out? Absolutely. Well, let me turn, let me ask um, Charlize and David, and and let's let's just have a pause to talk about what's sharing, what is being shared out out of this meeting. Some people have asked for slides. Um, a lot of people have mentioned different reports and things that are they're working on. There's all the, all the um, small group report outs. I think some of us I know are interested in looking at the, all the details and not just the aggregate. So um, what will be shareable from the meeting and, and how would it be available? Uh, oh, sorry. So maybe we can do some sort of Google Drive or someplace where people who are at this meeting can access like our individual notes from the different tables, things like okay. that, like any of the slides that might have been generated. If people are comfortable sharing their slides, maybe we can ask them to send that to us, because I know pe people either decided not to use their slides or we're changing them, so the versions we might we have might not be applicable anymore. So anything you feel like sharing with the group, if you send to us, we can Great. create something and let everybody know we have the full invite list. And Great. And I, and I would say, I think, I know just from being part of, I mean, I should also, I think Charlize and David put an incredible amount of work into just thinking through this meeting, who was going to be here and how to, how to really approach it. And, and I think, um, and they had a whole planning committee that they actively worked with, but I think that I really want to thank them for the, the, the investment that you all made in this, this meeting. But I, I think, to Seema's point, this meeting is convened because these are real questions. This wasn't a thought experiment. These are real questions, and we really are trying to, interested in shaping a research agenda here. And I think that's where Jeff's going to take us into sort of next steps for what is, the, what can we, what is this going to look like? What could this look like? Um, but these, so I think as you have ideas on your metro ride, airplane ride home, um, please send those thoughts forward because we want this to be as rich and meaningful as possible because these are real questions. Yeah, I, yeah I Jennifer. I could turn it back to you guys too just for a minute and say what do you want to do after this? So 
we are really eager to collect up all of the thoughts and inspirations and things that came during the discussion today and also as Kelly was saying, after you leave and you sort of get your ha thoughts together and you think, oh, shoot, why didn't I bring it up or why didn't I say it that way or what have you. But, you know, there is ample opportunity after this to keep this dialogue going in lots of different ways. If you all are interested in continuing this dialogue through, you know, we could have webinars, phone calls, whatever. We can do a Google Doc. We can do whatever you like. We'll put together some kind of report. But having that kind of more active um, dialogue with you all over time would be really helpful. But I, you know, we're aware of everybody's uh, lack of time and, and uh, focus on other things and that sort of thing. So I think I would throw it back to the group and say, how, how would you like to proceed from here? Because it seems like lots of good stuff arose. There's still a lot of sort of um, potential settling of it or, 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 you know, discussing and sort of hashing out, you know, real, um, real goals out of some of this. And, and how would you like to proceed with all of that? Maybe. How about, I think Jeff was going to take us into some next steps and I think talk about, but, and take us into, talk about from, I think from your experience, Jeff, what, there's been some, some active work kind of, how do we grow the, the LC research agenda within NIH? And I think, but I, I think certainly Jennifer, Jean, uh, Charlize, David, Elaine, all of these folks, Sima, Please, I think, contact any of them, you know, as we, as we break here very shortly um, about how, how you'd want to stay involved. Um, but these are, these are some ideas. 